take nothing away from Michigan. They came, they saw, they conquered, they took names, they kicked ass, and they handled business all the way to winning their first national title since 1997. And even if the NCAA does rule down that the Connor Stallion sanctions are going to take this title away, people in Ann Arbor are partying like it's 1999 and Y2K is right around the corner. But the point that I'm trying to make is what went wrong for Washington in this game that eventually made this such a one-sided score? And more importantly, what does the future entail in Seattle now that the Huskies are headed to the Big Ten? Let's talk about it. If you are new here, welcome on into the channel. My name is Cole Thompson. I'm a radio show host based in Houston, and I talk college football daily. So if this is the type of content you enjoy, and we got a ton coming in the next several weeks, simply because the clock has struck zero on 2023 does not mean we are going to stop making content. Recap information from what we saw during 2023, a look ahead into 2024. You got to look at the transfer portal, names going in, names coming out. You got to look at draft status, a bunch of other nonsense. So make sure you smash that subscribe button down below. Leave a comment telling me your thoughts on what went wrong for the Huskies last night. Tell your friends, your family, your mortal enemies, your best of bros, the drunk dude passed out in a Waffle House parking lot, Washington fans and college football aficionados everywhere about this channel because we're on the race to become the number one YouTube show talking about our favorite sport. Go ahead and give me a follow on social media at Mr. Cole Thompson. That way, conversations surrounding college football never have to stop flowing. Okay. So, Michigan, last night, 34-13 victory. They secured the dub for the first time in, what was it, 27 years? That's an accomplishment in itself. And no matter what you want to say, this was an elite team. But so was Washington. Going into this matchup, you knew exactly what Washington was about. They had an identity, and they played to their strengths. Physical when it came to threading the needle, accurate, pinpoint, pristine route running, and the ability to manipulate defensive backs and allow your receivers to win over the top. That was the MO. And going into this game, I think a lot of Washington fans, I think most of the national people realized, you were never going to win at the line of scrimmage. You don't have the same size and the same demeanor as those in Ann Arbor. You're not built the exact same. One's built on finesse, one's built on meat and potatoes. That's the brand of football that was on display last night. The problem was that when you look at this Joe Moore award-winning line, Something that I think always gets lost in translation is it's not always about the biggest guys up front or the guys that are withstanding the blocks. It's the guys that are giving the quarterback the most time to be able to produce. And this was the number one passing attack in the country, mainly because number nine is your starting quarterback, but also because the offensive line did a great job schematic out, uh, avenues for a guy like Penix to be successful. That wasn't the problem last night. That was the problem. You look at the way that this, this defensive front was able to corral and force Penix into feeling the pressure. They didn't get a lot of sacks. In fact, they only added in more pressures, but that's kind of like a better stat line, in my opinion. Sacks are a fine stat to go ahead and bring up with individuals when it comes to paying them or what they're worth when it comes to the transfer portal and NIL collectives. But I look at pressure rate, the ability to make a quarterback feel uncomfortable in comfortable situations. That, to me, is more important than anything else. And Penix last night showed 27 to 51, 255 yards, one touchdown, two interceptions. There were some errant passes. And in large part, that's due to the big men up front in the maize and blue that were able to corral him into making mistakes, throwing untimely, throwing without a repetition, without a rhythm, without a sense of purpose. And there were opportunities that... Even when you had the deep shot, you didn't have the time to get it open. You had Roma Dunze streaking up field, but by the time you caught him, you had to get the ball out or you were going to lose it down. And more importantly, you were going to lose yards. You were going to lose more opportunities for you to be able to score. So you took the short route to guys like Jack Westover, to Dylan Johnson, to Jalen McMillan, and they took away your best asset. We have to talk about Michael Penix, though, when it comes to the accuracy. One thing that has stood out about his game all season is when he is hot, he is hot. And, and this is a glorified rule when it comes to college football. When you are an elite quarterback, the one thing that you don't want to do is be going into cup three on beer pong and you're heating up and then sink it and you're on fire. And that was kind of what I feared going into the second half when you were a Michigan fan. That's what Michigan fans should have feared was, hey, he just found the end zone. He just drove down the field, connected with Jalen McMillan on what had to have been his best pass of the night, and now he's going to start to gain that inertia. Well, they got the big interception by Will Johnson, and that tied a shift in momentum back in favor to a neutral playing field. At this point in the game, 
Michigan was struggling. They weren't perfect at all last night. They had their mishaps. They were terrible on third down. They weren't able to find the passing attack really in the third quarter. The second quarter was hit and miss. They went for it on fourth down and gave Michael Penix Jr. exceptional field position. But at the same time, Penix missed several very qualified throws that you just have to make. The one on fourth down is a play that you have to drill 10 times out of 10 to Roma Dunze, especially when you're that wide open, when you watch as number one, it cuts in left and then breaks right. That's your moment to where you realize it's an easy six. And it was a little too wide and they weren't communicating well, but you watch as they came over to each other and said, we'll get them next time. And unfortunately, those type of plays only come once in a blue moon against a defense like Michigan. Make no mistake. Michigan may have had a lackadaisical schedule in the grand scheme of things, according to most people, but they are a team that did handle business and they were the one roster that had the significant margin of victory when it came to other opponents. So that's in large part due to the defense. I don't really care if you play against every team from Conference USA or you play in the biggest and brightest conference of college football like the SEC. You have a number one pass defense. You're good in coverage. We saw that a few years ago with Cincinnati when they played Alabama. Wasn't elite by any standards against the Crimson Tide, but they still were damn good with guys like Sauce Gardner and Kobe Bryant. The same thing goes for this matchup, especially when you have a headline cornerback that eventually is going to find his way on Sundays like Will Johnson. And so little bad throws, a couple of miscommunications, and then two costly interceptions ultimately was the difference maker. I think when you look at this Michigan team, they just felt like they were ahead. And I don't mean just in terms of the score. What I mean is in the process of where they are in their development stage of becoming an elite program in college football, they're a step ahead of Michigan. I mean, of Washington, just like they were the entire game. They have a physical offensive line that's able to open up lanes and protect their quarterback and do an exceptional job of creating opportunities for the offense. They don't have elite wide receivers the same way that you do when you look in the sidelines in Seattle but they do have talent that's able to move the sticks and be a complete cohesion for a quarterback like J.J. McCarthy. They have a stellar defense. They have an elite run game. They're able to play with exceptional depth. The second teamers would start on most teams. And you know what that sounds like? Georgia, Alabama. And Michigan's been building for this moment for the last two years where the self-implosion and self-discrepancies won't come back to bite them in the butt. So when I look at this matchup, you already knew you were going to be treading water uphill. It just felt like that this offense was one of destiny. Like, do you remember back in 2019, you talk about the offense that was headlined at LSU? Joe Burrow, Jamar Chase, Justin Jefferson, Terrace Marshall Jr. You look at even Thaddeus Moss at tight end. You go in the backfield and you had a really good bruiser type of finesse running back with Clyde edwards helaire that was how I felt about this offense when it came to Washington. Same color scheme, kind of. You know, you change the gold into a kind of tan. But besides that, same color scheme, same style of play. The difference was that the defense allowed too many explosive plays early and the offense couldn't capitalize once they finally honed in and started making the highlight plays that we saw against Arizona State, against Utah. So what does the future now entail for Washington? For starters, it's going to be a swan song moment for Michael Penix Jr. The man deserves a statue built outside of Husky Stadium for all of his efforts, for all that he's done. This was a kid that bet on himself, reunited with a coach that believed in him from the very jump after he didn't realize that he wasn't going to be playing at Tennessee. But now you have to move forward with the rest of your team. The good news is you have the right coach. Kalen DeBoer is a proven winner. If you have a proven winner, that's all you need. The second that that guy sets a culture inside the locker room, everything else kind of falls into place. And I expect Washington to at least be a player in the college football playoff with 12 teams. Does that mean they're going to make it every single year? No, but not every year you will see the big, bold teams find their way into a postseason pitcher. You could, but it's not always going to happen that way. They could take a step back next year where they finish 10-2, and two, and with all the other 10-2 and two teams, they come in at 13 or they finish nine and three and they come in at 14 or 15 or 16. Still good enough to be a top 25 team, but now it's about adding in these other pieces that you've kind of been missing, especially now that you're in big 10 play. But as long as you have the coach, 
you're in a really good spot. I'm excited to see what Will Rogers will be able to do with this offense underneath Ryan Grubb. They added in a wide receiver from Cal, so that should at least take away the sting of losing one, if not two wide receivers. They're also adding in a couple of big time players when it comes to the recruiting cycle. They have a young emerging tight end that's going to be able to replace Jack Westover. I think that this team is in a really good spot. Now you just have to realize Michigan was the better team on Monday night, but we could still be a great team that shows them business, especially with what we don't know what's going to be coming back for them when we take them on in the regular season. I think Washington had just far too many struggles in this matchup that eventually allowed Michigan to coast their way to a victory. But make no mistake, the Huskies are still a good team. There's still a roster that I think has all the capabilities of winning a national title in the not-so-distant future. And as long as you have a proven winner like Kalen DeBoer at the helm, things are going to be pretty easy for you. So I think the future is extremely bright, even though the sun is setting on this era of Husky football. It wasn't the avenue that everyone expected to happen, but it was one that eventually showed you the flaws that are potentially going to help you get better moving into the next conference in 2024. Hey guys, thank you so much for watching that video. Don't hit the X button yet. Make sure you hit subscribe to keep up with all of our daily content found on Just Saying It and anything else that we post on this channel. Bye.